on this prequel episode, we've got our Fifty Shades fan poll follow-up. We're learning about weird fiction and previewing Annihilation. Hello and welcome back to this film. This is the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. It is the episode after our first summer series, our Fifty Shades <laughs> episode, which was... Whew, Wow. What a session. <laughs> Four hours. Uh, we did mention on social media that that was our longest episode ever. That was my mistake. I didn't think we had broken four hours before. Uh, for some reason in my head, I was like, no, we definitely haven't broken. Like, I, I would mean, remember. you, yeah, you edit them. The episode, so if, so if I, anyone to remember, it would be you. I was but. like, surely we haven't. Uh, and uh, we went back and found that our uh, hung, Catching Fire I think it was the catching episode fire of episode, Hunger yeah. Games series was... 408 i believe and the 50 shades episode was 403 or something like that <laughs> so technically the catching fire episode was like a few minutes longer and i truly don't remember that being a four hour and, episode uh we are humbled by this error submissive yes. even yes uh and we will do our best to rectify the our situation. eyes downcast we apologize <laughs> but yes uh we uh <laughs> Anyways, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll, one of the later episodes of the Fifty Shades series will end up I'm being sure our we'll have, I'm sure ever. we'll have a lot to talk about. Summer series episodes never get shorter. No, <laughs> so they only get longer. We'll see. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting. But yes, uh, so yeah, uh, that's, uh, we, we got a lot to talk about this episode, including a ton of feedback from all of you lovely listeners about Fifty Shades of Grey that we can't wait to share and discuss so we're going to get right into it first with our patron shoutouts. I put up with you because your father and mother were our finest patrons, that's why. That new patron bumper you heard, it's the second week in a row. Uh, we started using because I, we, we are watching The Mummy for our patrons. If you're not a patron, if you want to hear our thoughts on 1999's The Mummy, if you support us for five bucks or more a month, you can hear that. And we, when we were watching it, we heard that line about... Uh, we. I put up with you because your mother and father were our finest patrons. And I was like, boom, patron <laughs> <laughs> section intro. Perfect. So uh, that's where that came from, in case you were wondering. Uh, but we're going to give a shout out to our patrons, including our new patron. We have one this week, Valkyrie Thomas. What a name. I believe it. Or no, it was Valerie. <laughs> it was Valerie. Hold on. It was Valerie. And I think my thing auto-corrected to valkyrie because did, did it? it's so i believe it's valerie with a y like that like it's valkyrie without hang the on. k basically hang on let me look look it up but i'm fairly certain that the name is valkyrie without the k so it's valerie but with like a y and i i typed that is that <laughs> it, it is valerie with a y yes. um but that you know what i wouldn't be mad about no, it no that's amazing assuming I, that's your actual name even if it's not who cares but like that's an incredible name but uh yeah, so I, I believe it autocorrected to Valkyrie because <laughs> I typed it with the Y like that. I was like, you surely you mean Valkyrie. Anyways, Val Valerie Thomas, thank you so much for supporting us at two bucks a month. Uh, you get access to early access and uh, ad free, which isn't a thing yet. Uh, we'll see, maybe one day. Uh, but right now you get it early access and you support us, which is we truly appreciate. So thank you very much. Now to, to thank our Academy Award winners, our $15 a month and up patrons. I believe they all are $15 a month. And they are Steve from Arizona, Paul, Kat Insminger, Ben Wilcox, Jeff Niederhofer, Teresa Schwartz, Ian from Wine Country, All Literature is Fan Fiction, Prove Me Wrong, Winchester's Forever, Kelly Napier, Gray Hightower, Eli Youngs, Gratch, Just Gratch, Shelby says, pre-order it, calls from, okay, let me do that again. I, it's new. <laughs> Shelby says, pre-order, it calls from the veil. That darn skag, V. Frank, upset but not surprised to find out that Bella and Alice fanfic I've been writing won't make a good movie, and Alina Starkov. So some things to address in these patron names. Mm. One, absolutely that fanfiction you're writing about Bella and Alice will make an amazing movie. If you're serious, <laughs> send that to us. I want to read that. <laughs> Very interested. We stan. Uh... Also, Shelby, apparently a new book, new collection, something. I don't know. It doesn't. I haven't seen what that is. I believe a collection. It calls from the veil. Uh, Shelby is a writer and uh, 
Monsters and Mayhem, I believe, was the last collection she had a story published in, and it sounds like maybe a new one. So go check out It Calls from the Veil. And then finally, our name change patrons, we have All Literature's Fan Fiction, Prove Me Wrong. And you're not wrong. Can't prove you wrong. I mean, everything is a remix. That's a saying could, for a reason. Could, you could argue, you could argue a more narrow and stringent definition of fan fiction, but you can't really prove this stance wrong, right. per se. Yes, uh, and so yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, it, it, depending on what you're qualify, qualifying as fan fiction, can definitely mm-hmm. you know you can exclude a lot of things if it's very specific. But in the sense of like, yeah, everything's a remix. Everything is based on something else to some yeah. extent. Yeah. Everything's fan fiction. All right. Thank you all of our lovely $15 Academy Award winning patrons. You're all truly the best. It's now time to find out what some people had to say about Fifty Shades of Grey. That was a great rhyme. Didn't mean for it to rhyme. It It just happened. I'm in the zone right now. I was into it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. We have a lot of comments. Uh, we have a lot of long comments, so yes, strap in. Lots of feedback. Very exciting. On Patreon, we had nine votes for the movie, zero for the book, and one listener who couldn't pick or potentially uh, wanted to abstain from choosing one of these. Vinny the Fungus said, Great name. <laughs> if I have to choose, it's the movie. Both are not great to me. Like, the book is such a weird mix of boring and uncomfortable. It's like watching the slowest train crash ever. You're not, you're not wrong there. The movie is like, now there's very nice seats and a really charismatic conductor, but there's still a train slowly moving towards a crash. Okay, that's, you know, you're not wrong <laughs> entirely. I, I, my, my thoughts on the movie are known. I think it's a little better than most people give it credit for, but I, I it's still, I, like I said in the episode, not sure it's a good Movie. Yeah, it's definitely not a great movie. Not even sure it's a good movie. I just appreciate it for what it is. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was a good analogy. Mm-hmm. Very um, yeah, a very good analogy. Yes. Very, apt. very apt. That darn skag said, "All I got from the movie was some secondhand embarrassment, and it sounds like I would have to be Ludovico techniqued into reading the book." So I voted for the movie. Also, when I first heard you guys say the word Grey Ace, I thought you were making a joke about Anastasia being an ace who was only into Christian Grey until it was explained further. My apologies to the aces out there, and I greatly appreciate the learning opportunity. You know, it really it ended up being kind of a convenient pun. It was a fun pun <laughs> accidentally that just worked out. But yes, um, there's and, nothing right, there's nothing wrong there about them misreading it that way. Yeah, no, and I mean, I, a year ago, I wouldn't have known what gray ace meant. So I did not I, know. No, uh, no shame in that. We're all learning all yeah, the time. All learning all the time. I I try to educate myself quite a bit, and that was the first time. Oh, well, it probably wasn't the first time I'd heard the term gray ace, but it wasn't something that my brain was like. That's yeah. a thing I know. Yeah. Like, I think about, I had heard of it when you said it, but if you asked me what it was, I don't like what yeah. that meant. I'm not sure I would have been able to tell you. So, yeah, no, uh, definitely. As long as you're learning and uh, doing your, which it sounds like you are that yes. darn skag. Absolutely fantastic. I'm not sure what Ludovico technique is. I looked it up. It's, it's a, a band. band yeah, but I I've, find... I've never heard of the band, so I'm not sure what the reference is. Yeah, I was wondering if it was like a weird autocorrect or if it's something to do with a specifically with that band that I'm just yeah, unaware of. Because when I googled it, I just found a band and I was like, see, okay. I thought it was gonna be like until I looked it up. I thought it was gonna be like a like some kind of niche psychology right. thing. Yes, that's what it sounds like. But it's a band, so yeah. Not being familiar with this band, I'm not sure what this reference is, but that's okay. I got the gist of it from context oh, clues. Wait, hold on. It's also a thing in the video game Binding of Isaac. <sighs> Another thing I've never heard of. Oh, oh, okay. I think I may know what it is, but I don't know. So in uh, so Binding of Isaac is a video game that I've heard of. I have I've only played a few minutes of it. Um, but I, so maybe that is the new, maybe more politically correct version of, and, and this is an outdated, um, term for it. Uh, we would used to have called it, um, Chinese water torture mm. where you, somebody is strapped down and you drip water yeah, on their yeah, head yeah, to yeah. like yeah. make them go crazy or whatever. So you can yeah. interrogate them or something like that. So in, I'm just assuming here because in the binding of Isaac, apparently 
it is a an ability where uh, 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 one of Isaac's the main character's tears floats over an enemy and then drips constantly, dealing slow damage over time. And so I'm that's basically you know the the right. water torture thing. And so maybe that's what it is. Hmm. I, I I couldn't Don't find know. anything else on Google about that, but that came up. So anyways, moving on. Let us know uh, that darn skag if that's what that is, or if it's <laughs> something to do with the band, or what. Lost Remote Control said, Can I abstain from voting for either? They are both just bad. Though I guess the book is worse. I guess the movie wins. I know I'm not the target audience, but geez, this is not great material. Fair enough. Look, I can't I can't be mad at anybody who's like both of these are bad and don't do anything for yeah. me. Like holding them up directly one to one, it's like it's so obviously yes. the movie. Yes. And but, I think because of that, it it helps elevate the movie. I think yes, watching the absolutely. movie in a vacuum, as I mentioned on the episode, it would not do what it did for me. Not that it did a lot, but it would it would not be <laughs> as enjoyable as it was had I not read the book. It, right. To have, but the, having read the book, yes. watching the movie, you're like weeping with joy. Yes. Like, <laughs> yes. Like, thank God. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Somebody who understands narrative structure and thematic elements and everything like and prose and yeah yeah it, it, it's <laughs> just so much better that it's like it's it's a revelation and characterization absolutely absolutely upset but not surprised to found out to find out that bella and alice fanfic i've been writing won't make a good movie said i vote for the podcast oh, did it best it's definitely much. the only thing connected to the source material that i could consume for four hours straight <laughs> I mean, depends on what you mean by connected to. If you get loose with what you mean by connected to the source material, I could think of a couple other things I could endure for four hours straight. But I get what you're saying. <laughs> Moving on. Steve from Arizona said this movie, this effing movie. I dated a woman that got super into this book and movie. I couldn't bear to read the book because it felt like a direct a direct attack on my middle school writing career. I can't believe a full grown person wrote this. I would agree with that. It is hard, yeah, to, uh, not to overly attack Erica, it, but it is it is astonishing. It, it is the writing is astonishingly juvenile. Yes, which you know, if if she didn't start writing until later in life, I I, I get. Right. But it is definitely like a lot of hallmarks of like things I was doing in middle school and high school. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Steve from Arizona went on to say the movie is even worse. This is where you lose me. <laughs> Jamie Dorman is so dense and unimaginative. Disagree. Light and time bends around him. Disagree. His role in Interstellar as the black hole proves this. Got him, I, I don't guess. remember that at all. Well, I mean, it's a joke. But I don't know. Was he in? No, no. The joke. So Interstellar, it, there's a big black hole in Interstellar. Yes. It's just a joke. Like he was playing. It, it's, okay. it's not a person. It's I remember like nothing yes. about Interstellar so a, a, a except fun, for corn. A fun jab that I disagree a with. Fun but. jab. OK. <laughs> and Dakota Johnson, a third generation actress hack with no real talent living off her mom and dad's name, much like her mother, Melanie Griffith, lives off Tippi Hendren's. I was getting flashbacks to Cherry 2000 and Working Girl and wondered aloud, maybe famous Hollywood people should not vouch for their talentless kids. If I want to see bad acting, I'll follow Tom Hanks' right wing trust fund douche kid. That kid's not an actor. He is a douche. Not an actor, so or at least not that I'm aware I, of. I, I think he's done a little bit of acting. He's mostly like a social media slash rapper. Like he's as Chet, as they do. Chet Hanks. He's he's he was a bit of a he was mainly a musician and like he released he was like the white uh, white boy summer guy. Do you remember oh, white boy summer? Yes. That was Chet Hanks, oh, which is okay. Tom Hanks' right. Yeah. <clears throat> See, I'm so angry. I'm writing like E. L. James. Fortunately, I broke up with that woman before I was forced to endure any more of this franchise. I wish you Godspeed on your quest to review this blight on modern culture. Okay. Okay, Steve. A lot of Steve. Steve lot from of, Arizona. A lot, lot there. I I've had a little bit of wine. I'm gonna say this, and and I I think I'm saying this in a gentle way. With all due love. With all due love, I think that your feelings about this franchise may be irrevocably entwined with your feelings about your ex. Seems like there's a little bit of ex 
excess negativity there, which is very understandable. There are things from past relationships in my life. Definitely. That are things that I, I will never look at the same way because of them. Uh, uh, you know, so yeah, that's fair. I will say I in wildly disagree with your assessment of Dakota Johnson. This is literally, I will say this, this is literally the only thing. Yeah, this is the only thing I've ever I've seen her ever in. I've ever seen her in. And I thought she was great in I this, thought though. she was, like, li- <laughs> like unironically really, really good. Yeah. Like, I, we, jo- you know, we joked and, you know, talked about it, but we even didn't, I, th- I think we did a good job of expressing that we weren't joking talking about how much we enjoyed her in this film. I thought she was, like, v- as good as you could possibly play this role. I, I agree. I mean, I think, like, similar to Kristen Stewart playing Bella it's not an amazing role yeah but both of them did what they could with it they did what they could with it and I think I would even put and 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 this is no disrespect to Kristen Stewart as uh, Bella I don't think Bella or and maybe that is also has to do with the adaptations themselves to some extent Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think Kristen Stewart as Bella elevated that role beyond the book like it she did as good of a job playing the Bella that you get as you can kind of expect uh she may be elevated a little bit but i would i would argue that dakota johnson like legitimately turned in a performance in this movie that is head and shoulders above the character in the book which a lot of it has to do with the writing as well but who knows how much of it is the writing versus you know because the the subtlety like i i can't stress enough the subtlety of her reactions and and again, that's a it's yeah. a partnership between director, writer, and all of the and a bunch of other people, not just those people and the actress. Um, but her the subtlety in her reactions to <laughs> to Christian throughout this film are so good. Yes, it's ridiculous. Well, it's like I mean, like we talked about in the episode, it's almost like she's taking the piss out of it. Yes, like but it, it's very close to being that. It is because I think the right, like I said, I think the writer and director were also doing that with yeah. the script a little bit um and and how they kind of rearrange things but she also while taking the piss i think also brings all of her like she's not cheating she's not like she's not like she's not smarmily like taking the piss and like not doing her best at you know what i mean mm-hmm. like there's not it's it's not like a it's not like a, a half performance where she's like rolling her eyes through it and like kind of like coasting no. I th- like and because and that's even beyond that's even before we get to I'm just talking about like in the dramatic stuff and the comedy and every like all the performance stuff she's doing and that's getting even like before we even get to the how difficult I think it probably is and I think people I I would bet underestimate how difficult it is to perform in like explicit graphic sex scenes yeah like that that is not i can't imagine is an easy oh thing. i i don't think i could do that like i, I, I it, by no stretch yeah. of the imagination and i think it's something we as a culture kind of like dismiss and like nah it's yeah. smut it's dumb like what but i think like and especially to do a performance that still feels it's one thing you know if you're like literally doing porn and you're just like fucking on camera like right <laughs> that's a little bit even that i think <laughs> it's difficult in its own way and has its merits but like that's a different thing where you're just like fully doing it and are into it and the camera happens to be there doing an, a performance in a film where it's like you're not actually having sex you're not actually because mm-hmm. you literally can't legally at least in most it's complicated but anyways um I think that that takes a an extra layer and like an extra weird different skill set that I don't think a lot of actors and actresses possess even if they are incredibly talented in other things mm-hmm. and I think Dakota Johnson was very good at both things and and Jamie Dornan for that extent I don't think he was as transcendent like in the role as <laughs> Dakota Johnson was but still I thought I thought both of them were very good so Anyways, uh, Ben Wilcox was our last comment on Patreon, and Ben said, I haven't actually seen the movie, but just by virtue of having read the book, I know the movie is better. Even when viewed as essentially unedited fan fiction being written on the fly by an amateur, the book is one of the worst things I've read. I did, however, find it interesting that you thought that Bella slash Anna was the author insert character, not Edward slash Christian. Given the lengths the books go to justify his behavior, and given the rumors about what a nightmare uh, James slash Mitchell is in person, it seems like Christian might actually be the author's darling. Can we somehow twist your arms to get you to read Grey, her version of Midnight oh, Sun? 
or maybe The Mister, her latest piece of original work. Oh my gosh. It might prove insightful. Okay. Well, I definitely uh, okay. want to read both of those, hang on. but also don't. No. Hang on. Okay, go ahead. But reading any more E.L. James after this series is going to be a hard limit for me. Uh, uh, Patreon goal. Hard limit. Patreon goal. We get us to like a thousand bucks a month. We'll read. My hard limits are non-negotiable. <laughs> uh, my hard limits are negotiable for a dollar per amount. <laughs> um but uh yeah no i i get what you're saying i i i just to me it's it would be so fascinating i'd be really interested to to read an original work that's recent and to see how things have changed i I like to read a little bit of it maybe not like the whole thing i would love to like experience a chapter there are like there are sections of uh gray which is her her christian perspective like rewrite of 50 shades i guess um that i would be like sections of it that i would be interested to go in and look at just to to see yeah like i I would be really interested to go in and be like okay let's read the blowjob scene from his perspective right because i bet that's funny nice 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 oh this feels good nice (laughs) yeah Uh, yeah um, but uh, so going back to uh, the the author insert part, I think that's really interesting. I think it's actually a pretty interesting um, assessment of it, uh, sort of looking at it and 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 pulling out that maybe Christian, in fact, is the author insert character. I still think it's it's um, Anna. Yeah, yeah, I was kept wanting to say uh, kept wanting to say Bella. I I, I do think it is Anna. Because, um, again, based on the interviews I've seen and and the other stuff is that she was writing stuff that she was fantasizing about. And I think it sounds like from the perspective of the submissive, like, I Mm -hmm. think that is what like so she and again, I think it's maybe so I I, I, here's the thing. I think it's probably both. Yeah, I was going to say Porcano Las Dos. Yeah, Porcano Las Dos. Like for like it's it's Anna is is the role she kind of wishes and and like like she like fantasizes fantasizes about about, on a conscious level. Right. Yes. On a conscious level. And then. Yes, exactly. And then Christian is kind of is more like the dark subconscious. subconscious. (laughs) Yes, I think, again, based on very little just sort of you know what we know from interviews and and new yeah. stories and stuff um i think that is absolutely potentially possible quick disclaimer we are not psychologists no we're not psychologists <laughs> we're not making that assessment i don't know el james so you know who knows <laughs> um but that is just you know kind of purely speculating i think it's an interesting sort of way to look at yeah <laughs> the two main characters yeah. in this novel all right. On Facebook, we had eight votes for the movie and zero for the book. Steven said, I didn't watch the movie or read the book, so my vote goes to Brian and Katie's rebu- review for being insightful and fun. Boy, everybody out here just lay- heaping on the praise. Didn't need this ego stroke right now, <laughs> but I appreciate it nonetheless. Bridget said, gotta be the movie. The actors have little chemistry, but I'd rather suspend my disbelief that these two actually like each other than suspend my disbelief at a relationship forming out of stalkery, no aftercare, zero boundaries, and or abuse as therapy bullshit <laughs> actions that were mercifully old yellered out of the movie. <laughs> that was a, this is a good sentence. Well done. <laughs> well done. That said, I would pay real money to go see a new version of this movie with the subconscious slash inner yeah. goddess voices added in, as well as Christian's line just straight up <laughs> dubbed by <laughs> Ian uh, McDermid, McDermid uh, a.k.a. Chancellor Palpatine. There are those that would consider my desires unconventional. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would pay money to see that movie. <laughs> It's pretty good. Yeah, it would be fun. It would be a lot of fun. (laughs) Adam said, going with the movie. Being fair, I never subjected myself to the book. We only saw the movie. But based on what you said about it, I'm sure the movie would have gotten my vote anyway. (laughs) There you go. As your friendly neighborhood linguist, you're right. Descriptivist is describing how language is used, like dictionaries do. Prescriptivist is des- describing how you use language, like English teachers Pre- do. Prescribing how you use language. Yeah, prescribing yeah. how you use language. Uh, reading it as charitably as possible, she might have meant 
descriptivism is a hard line for me, as in it is my policy that everyone must be descriptivist. I'll admit it at least made me like her a little more since prescriptivists are the natural enemy of linguists. One, I agree with your final point. It also made me like her a little bit more because I'm being <laughs> engaged to and with uh, uh, an English um, master. Um, yeah, a little. Like, well, um, I don't know. I, well, I guess I do have a master's That's degree. That's why I called you that. <laughs> Because you have a master's degree in it. That's fair. That's a fair point. Um, I, 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 I also have had, um, I don't think I was ever a prescriptivist necessarily, but I definitely was more so back in the day. And I've had I, my... I think a lot of people who are like readers and writers and like involved with language, like go, will go through a phase of prescriptivism. I think it's, it's because of coming through education, yes. you're taught that way. Yes. And so it makes sense that your brain just kind of assumes that's, how yeah. you know that's like oh yeah this is, and, I, and yeah. you know the two i mean as a former english teacher i do kind of want to say like english teacher slander but i am well aware that english teachers come in two flavors chaotic good and lawful evil <laughs> yeah and that's it yeah that's it those are the only two types of english I mean, teachers it, it's true i also don't think they were necessarily even saying um that I, at least to me, it doesn't read as as necessarily a negative when they're talking about English teachers teaching, you know, being prescriptivists. I don't even think they're necessarily implying that's bad in that sense because I think that is it, it, depending on the grade level and stuff. Obviously, yeah, um, maybe the more efficient, most one of the more efficient ways to teach English and language and stuff. I don't know. I I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a pedagogist or whatever, eh, or an English uh, major, but uh, it wouldn't surprise, you know, it, it, it's not like a, it, do, it doesn't seem outlandish to me that being prescriptivist sort of if in certain age ranges is like just the most yeah. efficient way to teach. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I always told my students and I, I taught a entry level college composition for anyone who doesn't remember that era of me. It's been a couple years. Um and I, I always told my students that you have to learn the rules before you can break them. Yeah. Because if you don't know the rules, you're not breaking rules. You're just doing whatever the Sam Hill you want. Right. Um, it's also a very classic refrain in film school yes. and in any artistic yeah. learn the yeah, rules, creative thing. Then break the rules. Yeah. Um, but, but I always tried to be as you know, open as possible to discussing the different la ways that language were was used yeah. with my students, yeah. which was t sometimes went really well and other times <laughs> was very challenging because I, I, I had a lot of different, as you can imagine, college freshmen, a lot right. of different like education levels yeah, yeah. coming in. A yeah, lot of especially a lot of yeah. different backgrounds. Because you were teaching like entry level yes. English, yeah. 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 So I would have some kids that came from like a really good educational background and other kids that didn't really even know basic grammar. And, right. and that does make that a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So I just trying to be a little generous there. Um then going on to the next point though, about uh reading it as charitably as possible. She might have meant descriptivism as a hard line for me, as in it is my policy that everyone must be descriptivist. I think I agree that reading it charitably, and I mean charitably, <laughs> because I'm going to go on to express why it's still stupid. It doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> reading it charitably, I do believe that's what she meant. But all that does is then, um, you know, not that we are, didn't already realize this and understand this about E.L. James. She does not understand what hard limits up mean. Yeah. Like what that term means, because if you're using it that way, then that's not what a hard limit means because in the context of using a hard limit, it is a thing you don't like that right. you don't want to do. Right. So you wouldn't say my hard limit is prescriptivism because I like descriptivism. Yeah. Well, <laughs> or, or right. no, you wouldn't say my hard limit is descriptivism because you like descriptivism and you want it to, to be what everybody does. You would say my hard limit is prescriptivism because you don't like that. That's how hard limits work. It, it, yeah. If your hard limit is being hit with a belt like Anna's is in <laughs> in uh, Fifty Shades, you don't say you, you'd say my hard limit is being hit with a belt. Not my hard limit is. I don't even know the con. Like there's not a you know what I mean. Yeah. It just doesn't. That's not how hard limits work. So it doesn't. And yeah. It still doesn't make. No, sense. I I don't think E. L. James understands hard limits or linguistics. Or linguistics. <laughs> 
I mean, if there's anything we learned from reading Fifty Shades of Grey, I think that's fair. <laughs> I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All oh, right. Um, our last comment on Facebook was from Andy. Andy, I did trim your comment a little bit because yes, you had a lot of feedback. A um, but if you would like to read the full extent of Andy's thoughts, you can find that on our Facebook page on yep. the poll post. Uh, and Andy said, it must be the film. It must be the film. The pod episode was great, and I have so many thoughts. <laughs> Thank you again. Here's how I felt about the book. The Fifty Shades of Grey reading experience is essentially the same as the Red Room. After much deliberation, you enter the room consensually as an adult who has decided you know what you are doing <laughs> and will have some kind of pleasurable encounter and at least satisfy your curiosity. <laughs> it's fair. Okay, it's I, fair. I did satisfy my curiosity, yeah. I suppose. I was to say, I'm not sure if I was expecting any pleasurable <laughs> encounter, but it was. there was a morbid curiosity that I was satisfying. However... You soon find yourself fleeing, <laughs> upset, having realized they do not really know what they are doing, and you're just <laughs> suffering the whims of a broken narcissist. I mean, okay, this analogy, I, who knows? <laughs> it works very well. <laughs> Once out, you understand the need to reevaluate your life and priorities. You talked in detail about how the film improves the book by cutting out the internal the internal monologue using simple but effective visual storytelling and allowing Dakota Johnson to be a bridge to us, the viewer. The more problematic, mean-spirited aspects are softened. I would add that the casting of J.B. Dornan as Grey is vital to this too, whether the filmmakers intended it or not. Dornan is naturally disarming and boyish, especially through his eyes. And I would agree with yeah, that. I would agree He's with got that. kind of a teddy bear vibe. And I think it was very much intentional, especially because um, we talked about in the prequel, the last prequel, that um, they originally cast Charlie Hunnam. And yeah. I don't think he would have nearly I, I, the yeah, same I don't think he would have the same energy at all. That that Jamie Dornan has. Like, he's, a, he's, a lot, char he's a lot sharper. You know, and we just saw him the other day in a commercial, and it brought me back to it. And I'm sure this is not in. <laughs> Did we? No, no, not one of them. Uh, a person I'm about to talk about. Oh, Sorry. okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, go on to say who I think would have been like truly perfect in this role. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think Jamie Dornan was fine, good, even bordering on great, considering the role. Um, but the person uh, who I think would have been like legitimately perfect for this role, uh, and it's again, this there's no way this is <laughs> a, a new fan casting or anything like that, uh, is Ben Burns. Yeah. We just saw him yeah. in a commercial the yeah, other day. We did see him in a commercial. Uh, but he plays I was basic, surprised he to plays see him in a commercial. He plays basically Christian Grey in the Shadow and Bone series. Yeah. Kind yeah, yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. When he uh, playing what's, uh, the, whatever the character's name is. I can't remember now. The um, Darkling. The Darkling. Which uh, is not his name in the show. No, it's a, yeah, it's a spoiler. The show did a good, uh, he's General Kurgan, I believe, yeah. in the show, um, which is also who he is. But it, it, anyways, it's complicated. Um, but yes, so Ben Burns to me. I think because but he's also he feels very much like like Jamie Dornan a little bit. To right. me. He has that similar energy of like being obnoxiously handsome. Yes. Um, and also having some boyishness, like vibrant, youthful energy yeah. and stuff and whatever. But also like an edge of danger. Yes. But also an edge of danger. And, and it's just all the the dark brooding eyes yeah and the hair like I, yeah, I, I think you know you great. know who i just thought of too and the, you know i have full disclosure that this might be influenced by some fanfic that i've read in <laughs> my time i just thought of tom hiddleston I, he honestly might even be better because i think ben burns almost has too much of the like dark the, like, broody like yeah. like bad boy energy and not enough of the like like, yeah, I, I, Tom Hiddleston, I legitimately think would be like, not to mention he's just probably the best actor among the three. I don't, I don't know if I would have survived that movie. <laughs> yeah, he might be the best actor amongst uh, all of them, or at least he's up there for sure. Um, but yeah, he, uh, Ben Burns is also very good. And Jamie yep. Dorn is good too. Anyways, um, we're just out here fan casting our. <laughs> okay. But like real quick, I'm trying. I was try as soon as you said uh, Tom Hiddleston, I was like, okay, that's perfect. But who then? And and I I think maybe still just Dakota Johnson plays Anastasia because we like we did say 
I don't know if anybody could do better. I was trying to like fan cast both roles, but I think I would fan cast Dakota Johnson in in unless there's somebody that plays better against Tom Hiddleston than Dakota Johnson, but I'm not sure who that would be. I mean, the name I had a name that popped in my head, but I don't know if she has the right energy for it. And it's also just because it, it only popped into my head because Marvel. But anyways, what were you going to we say? Are we thinking the same I hope we're, I hope hold we're on. thinking the we're gonna same We're going to count person. down for three. I'm going to be really interested. I, there's no way we're thinking the same person, but it'll be very fun if we are. So we're going to go three, two, one, and then on zero, basically mm -hmm. say the name. Okay. Ready? Three, two, one. Tessa Kat Thompson. Oh. No. oh okay. <laughs> We were not thinking the same person. I wasn't sure. I like yours. I like yours too, but I like mine better. No, I agree. I like yours better. Yeah. No, that's... Again, <laughs> might be influenced by some fan fiction that I've read. Yeah, that's fair. Because I, 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 the reason I like Tessa Thompson, I think she could. She has that combative mm -hmm. energy. Like, she could yeah. play the the smarmy, like... See, what... Not smarmy, but the, you know, like the playful, like sarcastic... Anna that we kind of get in Dakota Johnson. But I was imagining something similar to Dakota Johnson with Kat Dennings. She does that Like a lot that too. kind of like yeah. dry. <laughs> what? Okay. Yeah. yeah like yeah, that, that kind of thing. That's her But like even more bratty. Yeah. No, you're right. I, that's that's the movie I would like to see. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Hiddleston and Kat Dennings. And, yep. Okay. All right. Moving on. <laughs> uh, um, okay. Um, we're we're going to do a real... Uh, we're we're going to switch tracks real fast. Yeah. Uh, Andy also said, white slave trade is in fact a dated term for trafficking that was coined during the later colonial slash empire period, and it is problematic if used casually now. Okay. E.L. James using it is a UK class cultural thing, if you meet people from London or the home counties who went to private schools and grammar schools, they often have this cultural lexicon that is more rooted in that older period and more are more likely to use it in daily life. That's, so it, it yeah. sounds like a dated thing from yeah. the UK. Then. That's kind of what I expected. Yeah. I feel like I still don't know why it, it became a thing <laughs> to begin with, but like what i'd still say i mean I, I i to be fair i can imagine why it became a thing it was basically like oh this is a thing we need to care about yeah. white slaves <laughs> and and that to me too is evidence in point of my theory that she did not have an actual editor look at this on the first go around because a, a good a good edit a good editor would flag that and be like maybe we use a different word just a different word would <laughs> just be great any other word <laughs> child labor or something anything let's just come up with something different there yeah on twitter we had 11 votes for the movie two for the book and one listener who could not or would not pick kelly napier said the movie is bad the book is irredeemable when brian talked about it feeling off reading the book i totally agreed it always felt to me like wearing your shoes on the wrong feet Yes, you're still wearing shoes, but it just doesn't feel right. It is. It is the vibe I get watching some bad movies, the way dialogue is written, where it's yeah. just like, it's, it's just like what, this you, resembles. Have you ever been in a conversation? Yes, this <laughs> resembles real conversation and real thoughts, but like, it's just, I'm looking at it through a clouded pane of glass and upside down. Like, it's like, yeah, what, it's, it, it, yeah it's, it's. Yeah, it's ugh. like so an AI weird. wrote it. Yeah, it is. It is like an AI wrote it or something. And then it got edited by a human who was not a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> so like they kind of brought it like it, they took AI <laughs> and then they brought it back to something resembling real <laughs> like human speech. And then but they weren't like a talented enough writer to like. Uh, yeah, uh, it's very strange. April Edmansky said, I hit the book button by accident. <laughs> movie all the way. There you go. <laughs> so I did remove one. So so those two vote. does not include yes. April's. Okay. Well, actually, then I guess that should be 12 votes for the movie because I didn't add one. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Shelby says, pre-order, it calls from the veil, said, I read the first chapter and watched the movie equivalent for comparison. It's the movie. 
I bought that the world existed and that the characters were who they said they were. I enjoyed the movie scene on a basic technical level, and I would buy that these characters could be interested in seeing each other again. It's a nice change from the black hole that is their chemistry in the book. Plus, I didn't hate looking at it. Just so many improvements all around. I will say, just real quick, that there is a... If you're going to just wa- watch a short snippet to compare, that it is nice in this instance that I think one of the best ways to kind of see the improvements the movie made compared to the book is to like literally read the first chapter. Yeah. Or maybe two. Whatever, the, yeah. Up to where the interview ends, basically. Like where after she finishes interviewing him and gets on the elevator. I think mm-hmm. it's the first chapter, maybe the first two. Um, and that, that same section of the movie, which is like the first 15 yeah, minutes or whatever. Because, because it is very similar, but the changes that were made from one medium to another are very make striking. A huge yes. difference. Make a huge difference. And it's immediately obvious. Yeah. And, it, and so it is kind of cool in that regard that if you don't want to watch the whole thing, you can get the whole feel of it in that first scene in the first like chapter or whatever. And I would say if you want a more like striking one to one comparison, the contract negotiation scene. That one, I agree. That one's a little tougher, only in the sense that the in the book it's kind of like it. There's one there, scene. There is a scene where they yes. have dinner. There is one scene, but there's more conversation about it that is yes. like stretched out over the course of different conversations and email conversations and stuff. Um, and so, and, and, and the movie kind of condenses a lot of that down into that one yes. scene. And so in that regard, it is a little bit tougher of a one-to-one, but I agree that that one is almost even maybe more striking in how much yeah. better it is. I, I think just as, yeah, as a, like you're right, but also as a one-to-one comparison, I think it's, it's good for showing yeah. what the movie did with the material to improve it. I mean, we didn't even talk about the sexy asparagus in our episode. It's true. We did not. <laughs> We did not talk about this. You're all welcome. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Shelby went on to say there's an old trope in sci fi where they use science as a blanket explanation. Right. Uh, I made a monster using science. I went to space using science. I stopped time using science. I have a theory that Christian will use business the same way in this series. I mean, already, basically. He kind of does, yeah. Yeah. I I guess money more so than, like, business. Yes. But 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 he's a CEO, so. Yeah, in terms of things he does, it is money. But in terms of, like, whenever he talks about, like, the machinations (laughs) of what he does, it is sort of just, like, business word business it does remind me of something from a neil breen film yes where characters are just like shouting shouting buzzwords yeah yeah Yeah. or he is president of the bank (laughs) yeah Uh, we also got an anonymous quote uh, anonymous quote anonymous feedback on twitter which is something that i feel like we don't mention enough if you want to leave feedback and you're not comfortable having your name read you can always message us we don't say that yeah you're absolutely Um, welcome to yeah and and especially especially for something like this (laughs) yeah absolutely (laughs) feel free to uh, and always just um send us a private message or whatever and say hey i don't want my name but here's what i want to say yeah absolutely go for it and we will read it anonymously and no one will know who you are except for us (laughs) and we will never tell we will never tell so this person said bad prose aside this book, at, it, at its best, is irresponsible and at its worst, flat out dangerous in its portrayals, not just of kink, but of relationships in general. Every late relationship in this movie, including her friendships, are filled with so many red flags, it's scary. Literally none of her relationships are healthy. As far as her romance with Christian is concerned, the correlation that being a dominant in the bedroom naturally leads to being obsessive and controlling out of it is a bad precedent to set for anyone who may not know what a healthy relationship should look like. This isn't to say that kink in and of itself is unhealthy. Kink can be one of the healthiest things you can engage with in a relationship, but it requires an intimacy and trust on both sides that the author doesn't seem to realize. I will jump in and say the author, I think, at least understands that to some extent because it pays lip service to that i think yeah i think the author knows like that surface level concept yeah because there are numerous I, times i don't think she understands it right i agree and numerous times in the book christian does say you know we have to tr- you it's all about trust but like it, it like that is at least stated but it is yeah 
it, it doesn't it kind of just yeah. pays lip service to but it. But it's also like it's hard to tell if it's the author that doesn't understand that or if she's trying to write a character that right. doesn't understand and, that, that, and that would be just bad at it. Before we go on, that was my other thing is that I think that uh, I don't know. Again, it's hard to tell from the interviews I've seen, but. It, it seems to me reading the book that the author does understand that, but that this is in fact a a fantasy scenario about a character who, who, who breaks those rules because that's fun and sexy in mm-hmm. within it, like it's to the author and, and, and potentially to other people um, within this specific scenario. Um, but again, taken at face value taken, if you don't realize that's what's going on. Yes. Then it absolutely is um, problematic in the ways that this commenter is talking about. Uh, This listener went on to say, it's not BDSM, but my husband and and I engage in another variety of kink, and it's made our relationship deeper and stronger than before. What Christian and Anna are doing, while on the surface may count as kink, isn't it if you actually know what you're talking about, which the author clearly doesn't. The assumptions of what BDSM means and how the author weaves those into the book could sway someone reading it who just has an assumptive surface level awareness of those things to conclude that Christian's behavior outside the bedroom is healthy within the definition of a relationship that engages in BDSM. That's downright irresponsible on the author's part because books are immersive. You want to see yourself in the characters and imagine yourself in their world. If you're young and or inexperienced in what a healthy relationship should look like, you run the risk of equating obsession with attraction, and that's a dangerous path to go down in real life. Also, consent in a written contract does not equal consent in every situation. The idea of, well, I said yes once, so I guess I just have to go along with this even though I'm uncomfortable, is bullshit, and I'll be damned if my daughters don't learn from me that you have the inalienable right to change your mind and that prior actions do not ensure future engagements. Fuck the author and fuck the characters for implying that once you say yes, all bets are off. I mean, I would agree with all yeah, of that. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. It complicated slightly by the sense that I'm I'm not sure that I don't know. we've we've already expanded on. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and and I, I think a lot of this goes back to what we talked about with the absurd popularity, yeah. like mainstream popularity that this franchise received. If this had stayed on the internet and been like you know, a self-published piece of erotica that right. people who are super into this type of erotica read, it would not be that big of a deal. Yeah. But because it went so broadly mainstream popular, you have a lot of, I think, unintentional repercussions from yeah. that. And I think somebody else, it's not in the comments here, but I think somebody else somewhere at one point commented about how the, it, it is really irresponsible. And I would agree with this. 100 percent for the book to not have any sort of forward or yeah something something to to express you know what's going on assuming yeah. that the author does understand yeah. that that you know right. what they're because writing if, is a if fantasy you're and whatnot not familiar with the genre conventions yeah you could easily read this as just a romance yeah 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 if you don't understand what you're getting into you don't understand that you're picking up a book that is again assuming it is a uh sort of escapist you know erotic fantasy that is not like what the author thinks is examples of like a good or sound you know bdsm and relationships and stuff it is um absolutely something that needs that warning at the beginning for people Mm -hmm. who don't understand that (laughs) and it doesn't have that (laughs) so yeah all right on instagram we have six votes for the movie one for the book however i'm disinclined to count the vote for the book that we got on instagram okay. because and i don't know if everyone knows this uh but i can see who votes for what on instagram <laughs> boom calling them out and the person who voted for the book on instagram is a person who has been I trying to troll, I think specifically you in our Instagram comments. They've commented twice. I missed this. Uh, and and I've noticed it. I don't because, pay attention to you peons. Because we don't we don't <laughs> get a ton of interaction and like comments and things on Instagram. Yeah, we it's get a few, not yeah. we get a few, but like 
Twitter is way way more of like right. of yeah, interaction more heavy interaction, for us. Yeah, for sure. Um and Facebook even more so than Instagram. We don't get tons of interaction on Instagram, so I definitely notice yeah. when we get comments and things on there. And and this person oh, has commented on I two separate this, posts yeah. um and on one said Brian's favorite book right. and then on another Brian's favorite movie. So I'm pretty sure this is a person who's trying to like troll just, you and yeah, doing a bad being, job of it. They're just being facetious. Um so I will allow it for now, Tim Wahoo. <laughs> but you're on thin By fucking name. ice. By name called out. <laughs> yeah. So what was the final vote? Uh, the final winner was the movie. With 35 votes to the movies, or there was a movie with 35 votes to the books three. And one of those potential troll votes. One of those was a potential troll vote. Uh, I will say that I'm a little disappointed. I won't call out the person. There was somebody who voted for the book who didn't comment and say why they voted for the book. Who is somebody who comments fairly often. Why didn't you comment? Are you talking about on Facebook? Yeah. That person changed their vote. So it oh, might did have they been a mistake. Oh, yeah. okay. Then never mind. <laughs> Never mind then. <laughs> but we did have we had two votes on Twitter for the book that nobody commented to say it was a mistake like okay. April did. Right. So whoever those two people were felt disinclined to explain. Okay. Well, I yeah, so they never mind. You're all, you're fine, Colin. <laughs> It was Colin, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Cause I saw Colin uh, and I was like, hey, is that, that person, they, why would they vote for the book and then not comment? Cause they comment fairly often and seemed weird to comment, you know, pick the thing that nobody else was picking and not say why. <laughs> so, okay. never mind. And, and look, we have two more of these books to go. If you truly prefer the book series, yes. one, we want to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah. Very interested to know. I mean, I understand that it, you're coming. It's a it's a tough sell to get it's a you tough to sell. defend that because we're we're, we're coming in we're, very weighted on yes. one side here. We're so. we're coming in hot from the opposition. Yeah. Um. So if you again, if you want to message us and do yeah. an anonymous, anonymous comment, that's absolutely. totally fine. You, you could even not vote and just message. You know, if you don't yeah. want your vote like showing up somewhere, you could just yeah. not vote. Just send us a message. Send and be like, I message. prefer the book because of X Y Z. So you can do that, uh, or if you do want to comment i promise i will step in if you get dogpiled yeah. by our other listeners but i also our, our listeners are, are nice people so I, I don't think they would do we that. have cultivated a wonderful beautiful a chef's audience. kiss audience the over best. here all right it's time now to learn a little bit about weird fiction no matter what anybody tells you words and ideas can change the world Okay, so I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do for a learning things segment for this. So usually when that happens, I go on the Wikipedia page for either the book or the movie and just start kind of like scanning mm -hmm. to see if I see anything interesting. And I was on the Wikipedia page for the book and I see listed as one of the genres weird fiction. Amazing. And I was like, surely not. <laughs> That's an amazing genre. <laughs> Big fan of that genre, uh, but it, it but it is a genre, uh, a subgenre to be more specific. Uh, weird weird fiction is a subgenre of speculative fiction, uh, which originated in the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. Uh, weird fiction did not speculative fiction. Uh, weird fiction either eschews or radically reinterprets. Uh, typical antagonists and figures in supernatural horror fiction your ghosts your vampires your werewolves mm -hmm. your monsters etc weird fiction also often attempts to inspire awe as well as fear in response to its uh, creations hp uh, lovecraft because you know he was gonna come up here of course uh, he popularized the term weird fiction in his essays uh, in his essays supernatural horror fiction supernatural horror in literature lovecraft gave his definition of what weird fiction is quote the true weird tale has something more than secret murder bloody bones or a sheeted form clanking chains according to rule a certain atmosphere of breathless and unexplainable dread of outer unknown forces must be present, 
and there must be a hint expressed with a seriousness and portentousness becoming of its subject of that most terrible conception of the human brain, a malign and particular suspension or defeat of those fixed laws of nature which are our only safeguard against the assaults of chaos and the demons of unplumbed space. And you know it's good because he spelled demons with an A. Yes. <laughs> I particularly like unplumbed space. Yeah, no, it was very good. Um, and it, this is uh, arguably, I think, my favorite genre of horror. Yeah. Is this kind of like psychological. Yeah, it's like psychological speculative. Sci-fi horror. Yeah. Like weird. Yeah. yeah. Weird. Weird <laughs> yeah. fiction. Yeah. Uh, although the term weird fiction did not appear until the late, till the 20th century, Edgar Allan Poe, is often regarded as the pioneering author of weird fiction. Uh, Poe was identified by Lovecraft uh, and later others uh, as the first author of a distinct type of supernatural fiction different from traditional Gothic literature, right? So what he was doing wasn't quite the same as like his Gothic peers. Mm -hmm. Other authors considered to be early pioneers of the genre are Sheridan Le Fanu, E.T.A. Hoffman and Walter Scott, among others, American literature scholar Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock has suggested that there was a period of old weird, weird fiction that lasted from the late 19th to the early 20th century. So kind of like an initial emergence of this subtype of genre. Right. Uh, but the genre then reemerged. From the 1940s to the 1980s, uh, through authors like Ray Bradbury, Philip K. Dick, Angela Carter, and Octavia E. Butler, again to name just a few authors um, as writing within this kind of slippery yeah. to define genre. It's definitely one of the more sort of nebulous yeah. genres that yes. we talk about. <laughs> uh, Jeff Vandermeer and China Melville. Meville. Meville, Meville have suggested that weird fiction has seen a more recent resurgence, a phenomenon that they termed the new weird. Um, the Wikipedia article for weird fiction didn't have a separate list of authors for this reemergence, uh, but the 1940s to 1980s section listed quite a few contemporary authors who are still writing, uh, including the author of this book, Jeff Vandermeer, and every 90 kids, 90s kid's favorite, R.L. Stein. R.L. Stein, absolutely, <laughs> for sure. Like I said, I think this genre is a little slippery to define, but I definitely can see the difference between what's described here and other subgenres of speculative fiction and horror and sci-fi, uh, even if I can't like quite rigidly define this. Yeah. Uh, Weinstock, the, the scholar that I mentioned earlier, uh, defined it saying, quote, Old weird fiction utilizes elements of horror, science fiction, and fantasy to showcase the impotence and insignificance of human beings within a much larger universe populated by often malign powers and forces that greatly exceed the human capacities to understand or control them. Yep. Which I think is, is pretty good. Yeah. Definition. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, it makes sense that H.P. Lovecraft is kind of the, the, the OG Maybe not the OG, but like one Poe was the OG. Sorry, Poe, but but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean that's fair. But H.P. Lovecraft, to me, based on everything you've said about this genre, is the one that makes the most sense to me. Is like mm -hmm. quintessential mm -hmm. weird fiction. I would probably say like H.P. Lovecraft, but yeah. Uh, some related genres and subgenres to this include cosmic horror, dark fantasy, Lovecraftian horror occult detective surrealism and urban fantasy interesting i don't know let's see i think i think if i had to guess i'm just trying to segue here that annihilation of those subgenres would fall most into either cosmic horror or surrealism I, based on the very little I know about, I have not read or watched based, it, so I don't know. Based on the screen caps that I've seen, based I would like, say probably yes. Yeah, those two the most, maybe. Also yeah. Lovecraftian, maybe a little. I don't know. I don't actually know. I'm just guessing. Yeah, but. and it, it is interesting because I, I think the line between these, all these different like subgenres is potentially very very thin well it's definitely ones where like definitely some of those can also be other ones like yeah. something could be cosmic horror and an occult detective or or an occult detective and lovecraftian horror for sure like that's right yeah that, 
yeah, so some of those can definitely like crisscross, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I did watch a a Netflix series recently that would definitely fall into this. Um, Archive 81 or 87. There was a series called Archive 80 something, um, that very much would fall into this genre. Uh, it got canceled after one season. It wasn't. It was okay. Womp womp. It was. It was okay. It was pretty <laughs> good, but it wasn't like amazing. But I think that would definitely fall into this. That to me would yeah. be the um, occult detective, uh, and the Lovecraftian horror because it's about a guy like going through these old videotapes trying to figure out like a mystery, mm-hmm. and then it like turns into this like weird, yeah, dimensional like you know thing where there's like this this thing, this creature from some sort of alternative plane or something and Hmm. anyways very interesting kind of fun little show um but yeah it definitely would fall right into this all right speaking of other things that fit in i mean that's why we talked about it (laughs) into this genre let's learn a little bit now about annihilation the book can you describe its form no start from the beginning What do you think I do when you're away? You think I'm out in the garden, pining, looking up at the sky? (laughs) Why aren't you here? I gotta leave a day early. Your husband's here. Annihilation is a 2014 novel by American author Jeff Vandermeer. It is the first in a series of three books called the Southern Reach Trilogy. I gotta say, we love a last name where there's a capitalized letter that far into the... (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's one thing to be like a mix something where you have like a capital M, lowercase c, uppercase letter... But to be Vandermeer, where the M six letters in (laughs) or seven letters in is capitalized is something else. (laughs) The inspiration for Annihilation and uh, its subsequent books in the trilogy was a 14 mile hike through St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge in northwestern Florida. Many of the animals and vegetation that Vandermeer has seen on this hike over the past 17 years appear in the novel. Uh, I'm assuming more uh, cosmic horror versions of those, I hope. But it's Florida, so who knows? I'd say it could just be the normal (laughs) fauna of Florida. Uh, He has said that someday he hopes to do a weird nature anthology as well. I haven't read the book, but it sounds like he already did, bud. (laughs) Um, in March 2014, as a piece on Vandermeer and Annihilation, uh, he actually visited the St. Mark's Lighthouse as well that inspired one of the settings in Annihilation. The reviews for it were generally positive. Jason Sheehan of National Public Radio described the book as page-turning and suspenseful, saying, quote, about three hours later, I looked up again with half the book behind me and wondered how I'd gotten from there to here. The Washington Post said that it was, quote, successfully creepy, an old style gothic horror novel set in a not too distant future. And the Daily Telegraph said that it, quote, showed signs of being the novel that will allow Vandermeer to break through to a new and larger audience. The novel also won the 2014 Nebula Award for Best Novel. Uh, That's one of the bigger like sci fi awards. I believe Lindsay Ellis won that. For her book, didn't she not? Maybe. I think she did. I I think it won the Nebula. I could be wrong. Or at least nominated for the Nebula, I'm pretty sure. I remember that in relation to her. her It's not like the biggest one. I think the Hugo is the biggest like sci-fi fantasy, but it's a pretty big one. Uh, It also won the 2014 Shirley Jackson Award for Best Novel. There you go. Uh, Shirley Jackson, uh, another author that I would put under weird fiction. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) All right, now let's learn a little bit about Annihilation, the film. Let me see him. He was extremely ill. You have to tell me where he was, what he was doing. It was his decision to go in. It's something they termed the shimmer. We've sent in drones and teams of people, but nothing comes back. But something has. 
You're a biologist. He served in the military. If I knew what happened, I could save his life. The boundary's getting bigger, it's expanding. We're talking cities, states. You need to know what's inside. So do I. It's beautiful. Annihilation is a 2018 film written and directed by Alex Garland, known for 28 Days Later, Sunshine, he wrote both of those, did not direct them, Ex Machina, Dread, and Men. He also didn't direct Dread, sorry. So he wrote 28 Days Later, Sunshine, and Dread. He directed and wrote Ex Machina and Men, which just came out a couple weeks ago. The film stars Natalie Portman, Jennifer Jason Leigh, Gina Rodriguez, Tessa Thompson, mentioning Tessa Thompson, Tuva Novotny, Benedict Wong, Sona, uh, Sonia Mizono, David Gyasi, and Oscar Isaac. The film has an 88% on Rotten Tomatoes, a 79 on Metacritic, and a 6.8 on IMDb. Considerably lower on IMDb, mm. which uh, doesn't surprise me, because mm -hmm. we'll get into it uh, probably during the episode, but I think... People were expecting a very different film. Yeah. Like general yeah. audiences were expecting a very different film than what they got when they went into yeah. this one. I was going to say, too, real quick, that's a hell of a cast. Oh, it's a great I, cast. I, I didn't yeah. know most of these people were in this movie. I knew Natalie Porton because she was on all of the yeah. marketing the only this movie. The only two I knew were <laughs> Natalie Portman. Uh, or Sorry, I knew three. I knew Natalie Portman, Gina Rodriguez, and Oscar Isaac were in it. Yeah. I knew those three. I did not know the uh, the rest of them were in it. Like I had no idea Tessa Thompson, Benedict Wong, uh, Jennifer Jason Leigh. I didn't didn't know any of them were in it. Yeah. So. The film made forty three point one million dollars against a budget of forty million to fifty five million, according mm. to Wikipedia. So uh, mm, not great. Not great. Bit of a loss. Yeah. Especially after marketing. Yeah. It was nominated and won a ton of like smaller film festival and sci fi awards, but it was not nominated for anything in like the well known. Golden Globes, Oscars, yeah. whatever, take your pick. None of the big awards it was not nominated, but it did it had tons, like dozens and dozens of awards from other smaller like critic and film festival things and stuff. So, uh getting into the production a little bit, Paramount purchased the rights to the novel before it was even released in March of 2013, and Alex Garland was immediately brought on after having worked with producer Scott Rudin who bought the rights to the film on Ex Machina. It makes sense. Yeah. It tracks, it tracks. So Alex Garland would go on to explain that his adaptation wasn't necessarily, or Alex Garland would go on to explain after he signed on that his adaptation was necessarily based on only the first novel in the trilogy. Quote, at the point I started working on Annihilation, there was only one of the three books. I knew that it was planned as a trilogy by the author, but there was only the manuscript for the first book. I really didn't think too much about the trilogy side of it. So when he was adapting this, he mm. was not thinking about like where it would go and what would happen or if they would make more. He was just doing this one. And he would go on to say that his adaptation is, quote, a memory of the book, end quote. And I read another thing saying that he did not reread the book after the first time he read it. And that he wanted it to be like oh. quote, a memory of the book. Now that was oh, a that, that was the, the the he did not reread it thing was a, was a uh, an IMDb trivia effect. Take mm. that with a grain of salt. Who knows? I don't mm -hmm. know. That could be nonsense. Uh, I'm sure he referenced memory it at some point writing the, the thing. I feel like this could make for an interesting episode. Yes, um, but he wanted it to be a memory of the book rather than a book referenced screenwriting, with the intention of capturing the quote dreamlike nature and tone uh, that he had while reading the novel. So rather than trying to directly adapt the book, he tried to take the story in his own direction, and he did have Vandermeer's permission to do this. Uh, he also did not read the other two books when they came out, because they did eventually come out before they made the movie, um, but not before he wrote his first draft of the screenplay. It's very complicated. Like, mm -hmm. they came out at some point down the road, but in production, and he didn't read them. Because uh, he was concerned that this would he would need to revise his script too much, and he did so he he did not read the next two. He just was like, "I'm doing this one. Yeah, don't want to know That's what it. goes on. This is what I I, I have this. I'm I doing don't this. care to learn anymore. Yes, which I think makes sense. Uh, and then others would go on to later to inform him that elements of the later books had surprising similarities to kind of like some of the decisions he made in his screenplay. Interesting. Uh, in 2018, uh, the, like the year the film came out, um, Alex Garland was criticized by the Media Action Network for Asian Americans and American Indians in film and television advocacy groups 
for whitewashing the roles played by Natalie Portman and Jennifer Jason Leigh. Uh, in those novels, uh, the biologist, uh, Natalie Portman, is described as being of Asian descent, while the psychologist, who I assume is Jennifer Jason Leigh, is mixed race and half indigenous. Both Portman and Leigh are obviously white. Uh, so Alice Garland responded to this, accus- or this criticism slash accusation by saying, quote, there was nothing cynical or conspiratorial about the casting and that the book in which the characters' races are revealed which is not the first book, it's Authority, which is later down the line, had not been released at the time that he wrote the screenplay and that they cast mm. the first movie. So he did not actually know, supposedly, again, his accounting of it. They were not aware that these characters weren't white when they were casting the, the film. Uh, Natalie Portman also responded to this by saying that she didn't know her character's uh, ethnicity until the whitewashing concerns by groups were raised. Um, and that Garland had intentionally not spoken to Vandermeer about the other two novels because he wanted to focus on just the single adaptation of Annihilation. Again, I don't know enough of the details. This is yeah. a very brief summary of that. Um, it, it would surprise me based on what I know of Alex Garland's writing if he were like intentionally whitewashing roles or, you know, even subconsciously. I don't know. It just doesn't strike me as the kind of thing he would do. But, you know, who knows? A uh, couple more notes. So, due to a poorly received test screening, uh-huh. eh, but it gets, it's got a happy ending, don't worry. Okay. David Ellison, a financier and producer at Skydance Films, who was involved in the movie, got concerned that the film was, quote, too intellectual and, quote, too complicated mm-hmm. and demanded that changes would be uh, were made to appeal to a wider audience, including making Natalie Portman's character more sympathetic and changing the ending. Scott Rudin, the producer who I mentioned earlier, who signed on Alex Garland would go on to side with the director, Alex Garland, and who did not want to alter his film. Rudin, who had final cut privilege, defended the film and refused to take notes from Ellison. (laughs) Is it a happy ending though? Because the movie bombed. I would argue it's a happy ending. I mean, sure. The movie bombed, but we got, I, those those kind of notes are never good. They never make uh, yeah, the movie better. That's fair. Almost never, it's especially fair. a movie like this. Like, sure, maybe for like a blockbuster, like popcorn flick. Like, you know, yeah. if you're gonna add notes to like the Lost City or some, you know, some big like crowd pleasing, I'm I'm fine. Go for it. But in terms <laughs> of like you know a, a sci fi adaptation yeah. that's all about thematic, heady stuff, intellectual yeah, sci fi. I don't need yeah. some dude who's like, oh, the test screening went over poorly. It's fair. Change things. Change things. Like, <laughs> fuck that guy. Uh, so uh, this is also interesting. Oscar Isaac, who I mentioned was in this movie, uh, was brought on, obviously, because of uh, his prominent role. In, well, not necessarily because of, but he had a prominent role in Ex Machina. Yeah, so um, he had worked with the director He had worked before. with Garland before. Uh, he filmed this movie and The Last Jedi on adjacent studio lots and actually used the same trailer for both films and would <laughs> film, film scenes for both movies on the same day at different times. Oh, that sounds exhausting. Very exhausting. And then finally getting into some reviews of Annihilation, the film. Richard Roper of the Chicago Sun-Times gave the film four out of four stars, praising it for taking risks and saying, quote, kudos to Garland and the cast. Kudos to Garland and the cast, but bravo to Scott Rudin as well. Apparently you knew a masterpiece when you saw it, and you made sure you were we were able to see it as well, referencing maybe yeah. some of the stories that had come yeah, out yeah, about yeah. <laughs> the, the changes Mr. Moneybags over yeah. here who wanted to make the changes. Uh, writing for Rolling Stone, Peter Travers, a very well-known um, film critic, complimented the cast and Garland's writing and direction, giving the, giving the film 3.5 stars out of four, saying, quote, Garland needs to make no apologies for Annihilation. It's a bracing brain teaser with the courage of its own ambiguity. You work out the answers in your own head, in your own time, in your own dreams, where the best sci-fi puzzles leave things. Which, you know, yeah, I can agree with that in general, depending on the type of sci-fi film. And finally, The Economist described the film as, quote, tightrope walking the fine line between open-ended, mind-expanding mystery and lethargic, pretentious twaddle, (laughs) but praised its final hour. All right. Which, some of my favorite movies ride that line, so... (laughs) We shall see. Oh, before we tell you where you can watch this, we wanted to remind you you can do us a giant favor by supporting us on Patreon. Just search for this film, is, or sorry, just go to patreon.com slash this film is lit. You'll find us there and you get access to all kinds of stuff if you support us for five bucks and up a month. Uh, bonus content and all that good stuff. 
you can also follow us on social media facebook twitter instagram goodreads and if you want a, your feedback mentioned like we talked for quite a long time at the beginning of this episode about 50 shades of gray and what everybody had to say about it comment on those social media pages and we will talk about it katie where can people watch annihilation well, as always, you can check with your local library, or if you still have a local video rental store, you can check with them. Yeah. If not, you can stream this with a subscription through Fubo, Paramount Plus, uh, Paramount Plus through Amazon as well, FX Now, DirecTV, and Spectrum TV. Or you can rent it for around 3 to $4 through Amazon, YouTube, Vudu, Redbox, Apple TV, AMC Theaters on Demand, DirecTV, or Flicks Fling. Flicks Fling's a new one. Yeah, that's <laughs> a new one for me, too. Amazing. All right, that's going to do it for this prequel episode. I'm excited to read and uh, watch Annihilation. We yeah. mentioned it before, but we've been planning to do this for a while. In fact, we had it on the schedule and then had to move it off for various and sundry reasons but yeah uh very excited to finally read it and talk about it because it's a movie i i it literally alex garland has written some of my favorite films especially some of my favorite sci-fi films i always forget that he did 28 days later in sunshine because mm -hmm. those are both danny boyle directed films and in my brain i just assumed danny boyle wrote them uh and he did not which makes sense that i also like those movies so much because it's yeah uh 28 days later sunshine um and ex machina is a hell of a three film yeah writing like resume that is pretty good so yeah uh i'm very excited to watch this like i said and read it this is a switch episode in case we didn't mention yes that. it's your birthday episode yes i picked this one wanted to talk about it and so i will be reading it uh so ex expect a longer than normal episode because i take too many notes <laughs> but anyways you just don't have as much practice culling your thoughts as i do i i call them i just have so many thoughts to begin with i i just i i take notes on everything and then i still call them and i still have way too many it's it's a thing anyways yeah that'll be in two weeks time we're talking about no in one, one week's, week's time, time. it's a prequel right now we're, yes. we're recording this ahead of time so it's yeah a little early it's like two weeks almost <laughs> for when we'll actually be recorded in one week's time we'll be talking about annihilation and until that time guys gals non-binary pals and everybody else keep reading books keep watching movies and, and keep, keep being awesome, awesome.